True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. In the early morning hours of June 19, 1982, Virginia and James Campbell were sound asleep when intruders entered their home through a window and entered their bedroom. As their grandson slept nearby, six rounds were fired into this defenseless couple. The two young boys ran to their live-in housekeeper's room for help, and she called 911. When first responders arrived at the Campbell home in Houston, Texas, the intruders had gone, and Virginia and James were dead. Everyone who knew the Campbell's peculiar daughter, Cindy, suspected that she was somehow involved, but the evidence was pretty scarce. Cindy attended her parents' funeral, but she was not welcomed with any enthusiasm from her family. She further implicated herself when she did all she could to collect on her inheritance. Join us at the quiet end for Betrayal in Blood. As Cindy focused on legal maneuvers to get her parents' possessions and their money, other family members hired a private investigator to get to the truth behind their deaths. The PI quickly saw Cindy's boyfriend, David West, as the weaker of two suspects, and they worked to exploit his vulnerabilities to get a confession. So lots to talk about here, and what are we going to be drinking? We're going to have another Shiner beer. This is Shiner 101 Czech-style Pilsner. So it is a Pilsner. It's a clear gold color, modest size white head, uh, aroma kind of outdoorsy, grassy hay, some sweet malt. That bready taste, a little bit of hops late, light-bodied drinking beer. Sounds delicious. Yeah, it's not bad. I mean, it does what it's supposed to do. (laughs) Well, come on down to the quiet end. I see a lot of the taps have changed, and there are a few sours I might try as well. Yeah, I'm sure they always want to have some sours for you. Well, yeah, they're very good about it, and I appreciate it. They always talk to the distributor before we record, I guess. Make sure they have everything I need. Okay, you got it. Okay. All right, so why don't you get us started on this discussion today? Okay. So Cindy was always felt to be a bit odd. Well, that's putting it mildly. Her siblings would remember her as a troubled girl, a difficult teen, and a strange, difficult woman. Her parents tried everything possible to help her, including counseling, but nothing seemed to make a difference. And as adults, Cindy and her siblings had different versions of their childhood. According to Cindy, she was physically and sexually abused by her parents, but her siblings said none of that ever happened. They remembered Cindy as a spoiled and ungrateful girl with very poor social skills. Well, James Campbell, Cindy's dad, was born in Cross Plains, Texas, just before the Great Depression. So he grew up poor, but he did very well in school, and he became a successful, affluent attorney in Houston. In 1949, James fell in love and married Virginia Hafner. She was a very smart woman, and she worked as his secretary and paralegal in his law office. Then in 1950, Virginia gave birth to the first of their four daughters, and they named her Michelle. Over the next several years, Betty, Cindy, and Jamie were born. By the 1960s, the family owned a comfortable home in a wealthy Houston neighborhood. It was a large, extravagant home with a law library, six bedrooms, four baths, and a garage, which the parents converted into a soda fountain for the girls and their friends. So it seems like it would be a pretty good upbringing. Nice childhood. It does. And it would seem if if they've got this soda fountain that it was probably a place where the neighborhood kids would hang out. Absolutely, yes. Now in high school, the other three girls flourished while Cindy had difficulty fitting in and making friends. Although Cindy did have a natural talent for art and drawing, she was always very negative about herself. By the time she was 17, she was planning to run away from her family. And she'd tried it before. So when she was 17, she saved up some money that her parents had given her, and she left. So she was homeless for a time in Denver, Colorado, 
and she met a man named Michael Charles Ray in 1972. The two got married, and they hitchhiked across the country. And within a few years, they had two sons together. But the marriage didn't last. And Cindy was a neglectful, pretty horrible mother. She left Michael, and her father helped her to get a divorce and sole custody of her boys. So did he not think she was that bad a mom? The father? Her father, yeah. Well, Cindy's mom and dad knew she had problems, but they never gave up their parents, right? And plus, they loved their grandchildren. They wanted them to be around. So um, I'll take it then that they're going to be significantly in the lives of the grandkids. Oh, yes. Well, they will pretty much raise those children because Cindy could or would not do that. Yeah. Okay. Plus, we don't know what that Michael, her ex-husband, was really like. He didn't seem so great either. Doesn't sound that way. No. So they're pretty much saving their grandsons and trying to help their daughter, who's still young and you know, they still have hope for her. They're not just going to write her off. Right. Now, Michael didn't pay any child support, and Cindy had no job. So it ended up that her parents took care of Cindy and her boys. Yes, all of them. Her two sons, Matthew and Michael, lived with Cindy's parents and Cindy, but she paid the boys little attention. So it was like they were all in his household and uh, no obligations from Cindy. Exactly. Virginia and James really did seem to want to help Cindy make a new start. Cindy enrolled in a local college where her sister Jamie is also a student. And that's where Cindy met David West. Yeah, so David had grown up with a kind of neglectful father and a very overbearing mother. His father, Duval, had been left by his first wife with their only child, a daughter, in the late 1940s. And he had been really devastated when his daughter was turned against him. He was a moral man and a gentleman to his second wife, who was David's mom. But he lacked emotion in any life situations. And he was emotionally absent in David's life. And David's mother, Cecilia, ended up turning all of her love and attention toward her son. So some dysfunction there. Yeah. Now David was in his late 20s and had been in the Marines when he met Cindy. When he first saw her, she was at a table in a student union, and he saw that his old girlfriend, Jamie Campbell, was sitting at the same table with her. Maybe a little awkward, but he decided to go over. Well, you have to realize that awkward never stopped David or Cindy from doing anything. I see. Yes. So Jamie smiled, looking very pretty. Uh, his relationship with her had been short-lived and platonic, because Jamie just wasn't interested in him romantically. No, and Jamie was the younger sister of Cindy, the youngest girl in the Campbell family. And recently, up until that day, she had been purposely avoiding David. He chalked this up to an unfortunate interaction he'd had with the Campbell family housekeeper. He'd called this Mexican woman Pinche Idiata and got himself banned from Jamie's parents' house. Very rude to this woman, very insulting, and Cindy's parents were not happy. The maid had insisted that Jamie wasn't home when he went over, and he knew that the maid was lying for Jamie because Jamie was avoiding him, so he was very angry. So when David went over to the table, he said hello to Cindy, who seemed just impossibly shy. Now, she looked at him from behind her stringy hair, but didn't say a word as she smoked a cigarette. So his first impression of Cindy was that she wasn't at all attractive. She wore her makeup like a clown, with red splotches on both cheeks. She's about five feet, six inches tall, and as he described it, big breast, chubby thighs, and jeans that were way too tight. Yeah, David didn't approve, and he thought about what Cindy could do to improve herself. Back in the Marines, he'd learned to hate fat, and he would look scornfully at any fat people. Jamie introduced David to her sister, but Cindy didn't speak. He remembered telling Jamie months earlier that he liked brunettes with strong bone structure and European features, classical beauties like Catherine Hepburn and Natalie Wood. Then Jamie had told him, well, you'd love my sister Cindy, who had these features. But she's crazy, Jamie had added, and she's driven a couple of psychiatrists crazy. <laughs> so now, David's thinking, I've met the crazy sister. Yeah, good introduction, huh? Yes. And he could see that she did have some pretty features, but she was very unkept and overweight, and he thought, well, maybe she has some potential. But she did seem quite spaced out. 
He actually waved his hand in front of her eyes and said something like, Earth to Cindy, and she spoke so quietly that he couldn't even make out what she said. Her face was a blank, but when she opened her eyes more widely, he did like their color. They were hazel with a tint of amber. Her breasts, waist, and rounded hips gave her an hourglass shape, but she was very overweight. So what he did is he imagined her 30 pounds lighter and thought, yeah, she might do. After speaking with Jamie for a couple of more minutes, he left the university. He wasn't actually enrolled there, but he would eat at the student union quite often. He was studying photography at the University of Houston and working part-time as a bartender. So it kind of seems like he was going back to the old college to scope out girls. Uh, Sure sounds that way to me. Yes. David saw Cindy again in the student union just a few days later. I said hello to her, wondering if she would remember him. At first, she hardly even looked at him, but then when he told the joke, she smiled. And after a while, he was surprised to find that she was bright and had a sense of humor. She was fat, but she was pretty. He began to see her as a project for self-improvement techniques he had learned. He reached out and moved her hair off her face. He told Cindy to stand up straight. Then he told her she could be a fairly attractive person if she just lost some weight. (laughs) <laughs> fix her posture, and dress better. Oh, boy. Man. Laying on the charm. He's lucky he didn't get clobbered. Yeah. Well, David asked Cindy about her weight, and she told him she weighed about 180 pounds. In what came across as a backhanded compliment, he told Cindy, Oh, well, see, you're not just a big blob of lard. You've got some muscle tone. And you've got good proportions. All you need to do is lose a few pounds. So, I guess Cindy, who didn't get a lot of compliments, was actually a little flattered by that, and she was smiling when he walked away from her that day. Most women would not have been happy with that. (laughs) No. No, but Cindy kind of liked it. Yeah, Mr. Smooth. Yeah, and the next time they saw each other, Cindy seemed more friendly and more attractive to David. When he commented on how little she looked like her sister Jamie, she said, well, that's because I'm illegitimate. And she went on to explain that her father had impregnated her biological mother in Italy during World War II, and that he had sworn the entire family to secrecy. But for whatever reason, she was sharing this with David now. But David thought it over. This was 1980, and Cindy wasn't even 30 years old. So that timeline did not add up at all. So he thought, well, maybe she just has like a dry sense of humor, and she's kidding. That very same evening, David was working behind the bar when the phone rang and a woman asked for him, and this was Cindy Ray. She didn't seem at all shy now, and she told him he was cute. She had a really perky voice, which was different. He said, well, thank you, I'm flattered. He certainly wasn't used to women calling and telling him that. Then Cindy told him she'd like to go on a date with him sometime. That surprised him also. He still thought she was too heavy to really be attractive, but... It's not like women were knocking down doors for him. So he agreed to a date with her. Yeah, and when Cindy hung up the phone, she turned to her sister Jamie and told her that David looked like a pig. But she thought he was the kind of guy who would do whatever you wanted them to do. So he'd be like a dog, Cindy said, easy to train. So he's looking at Cindy as a project. Yes, absolutely. To to make her more attractive to him. Mm -hmm. Uh, And she's looking at him as someone that she can boss. Absolutely. And that tells you a lot about these people. (laughs) Yeah, this is going to be a good relationship. Because David definitely thought that he could save women. So he was like Cindy's savior. He was going to help her. And Cindy thought, well, this is kind of an ugly guy. I could wrap him around my finger and have him do anything I want. So quite a couple they will make. Yeah, there we are. Yes. Since Cindy had left her husband and come back to live with her parents... She'd really seemed crazier than ever. A few days earlier, she had attacked Jamie and their mother, Virginia, in their driveway, forcing Jamie to jump into the Chevy Suburban to avoid a full-on punch in the face. When Cindy turned to hit their petite mother, Jamie tried to run over Cindy with the vehicle. But before she could get it into gear, Cindy yelled out, Bitch! and ran away. And after that pleasant scene, their father had told Jamie that her grades at the university just weren't up to the Campbell family's standards. Just what a family. (laughs) Yes. And Jamie ran upstairs crying. Cindy told Jamie, you know what? We'd be a lot better off without Daddy. I think we should kill him, and I have an idea how to do it. 
Well, Jamie just looked at her sister and said, you're crazy. Cindy was really a scary person. And it was hard to be Cindy's little sister because the standards for Jamie were so much higher. Cindy just kept fucking up and doing terrible things and the parents just wouldn't give up and they'd try and help her more and more. But Jamie, if she didn't get all A's, she wasn't living up to the standards that they set for her. So very frustrating for Jamie and she was afraid of her sister Cindy. (laughs) With good cause. Yes. So Cindy had gone on to explain how her plan to murder their father would work. She'd dress up like a man. She'd wear men's shoes or heavy boots, leaving footprints around a window with some smoked Marlboro cigarettes so it would look like a man did it. And of course, she'd wear gloves. So this was pre-DNA. DNA was not used in criminal cases at that point. Still had quite a ways to go before that would happen. So if you're thinking, well, they could just test those cigarettes for DNA, (laughs) that wasn't something that they could do back then. I know. You were reading my mind. I knew you were going to ask. But Jamie just told her, you're crazy. She listened to a few more insane ideas and then ran out of the bedroom they were sharing. Their mother was standing outside by the door, and the look on her face showed Jamie that, yes, she had heard what Cindy said, too. But nothing was really done. Nope. So then Jamie phoned her oldest sister in Austin, looking for advice on how to deal with Cindy. Michelle wasn't home, but her best friend heard the story and told Jamie to report Cindy to the police. Jamie considered this and was thinking, how could she deal with Cindy every day and still continue to get good grades? Every morning, Jamie drove the two of them to the Midtown campus. At 25 years of age, Cindy still hadn't learned how to drive. The commute always sucked because Cindy complained constantly, criticizing Jamie's driving and threatening to quit her classes. Sometimes, for amusement, she would toss cigarette butts into Jamie's hair. That's sweet. So she's a very disturbed person. Those were lit cigarette butts? Well, I'm assuming, (laughs) sure. Yeah. She's not going to put them out and then throw them in her hair. So it's really kind of tormenting Jamie, who's just trying to go to school and get an education. One morning, Cindy had grabbed the steering wheel and almost caused the car to crash. And more than once, she told Jamie to pull over and stop. Once, she jumped out while the car was still moving. Jamie was still reluctant to complain to her parents because she was confident nothing was going to change. The family had always accepted that Cindy was the family's eccentric artist, and she lived in her own world. She lied all of the time, turning sister against sister, but she was able to manipulate them again and again. She was especially skilled at manipulating their parents. Ever since she was a young child, she'd been lying to them and hurting James and Virginia. In return, they always forgave her. Virginia made excuses for Cindy's destructive behavior, but recently Virginia had confided to Jamie that Cindy made her a nervous wreck. You try driving her to school, Jamie cried, happy to finally hear her mother speak some truth about her troubled sister. So James bought a car for Cindy and offered to pay for her driver's education classes. But that very same night, Cindy had a fit. She screamed at him to return it because she would never learn to drive. So he did as he was told, shaking his head, just exasperated. They really didn't know what to do with this young woman. No, it sounds like they're kind of at the end of their rope. Yes, but what can they do about it? Yeah. It's a hard situation. She is an adult. Yes, and they don't want her to run off with those little boys. God knows what would happen to them. Right. Now, each time David saw Cindy, she looked more attractive to him. She was still overweight, but it wasn't often that he got asked out for a date. So he entertained her with his Star Trek impressions and jokes. Cindy referred to herself as dumpy and nerdy. And over time, he realized that both of them really didn't like themselves much. He admitted that he hated his looks. He described his face as piggish looking. And he was surprised when Cindy told him she was dropping out of school. When he asked her why, she said it's my mother and father's fault. She said that her grades were much better than Jamie's, so they wouldn't let her sister drive Cindy to school anymore. David just didn't have any understanding how Cindy's grades could be better than Jamie's because Cindy hardly did any work. She didn't go to class. She just blew off any schoolwork. Pretty much, yeah. So David told Cindy that that was no reason to leave school and that her parents should really be proud of her. Cindy said that they were always messing with her head and telling her that she was a bad person. 
They ignored her and they were mean to her, she said. So Cindy's lip quivered like she was fighting back tears as she told David that her whole family just hated her. She told him that her parents had given Jamie a car, but they wouldn't even buy her an old clunker. David's mother, Cecilia West, had raised him to be hypercritical. So as her son, he wasn't impressed by Cindy's parents or by their home. The Campbell house looked cold and the grounds were kind of unkept. Jamie had told David that it was built in the 20s by a steel man. Anyone with taste would have torn the house down and started over, he thought. They had plenty of money, and he just thought the house wasn't up to snuff. But he did feel a lot of sympathy for Cindy, whose parents apparently wouldn't buy her a car or even give her the bus money to get to her classes. (laughs) So he often felt rage about the mistreatment of women. All his life he'd defended women and asked for nothing but their affection in return. And in the end, they always left him, except for his mom, of course. He had a duplex he and his mother had purchased with some inheritance money, and it was just blocks from the school where Cindy was enrolled. So he offered Cindy a room there so she could walk to school. He didn't have any plans to try and create a romance with Cindy. He just wanted to save her, and he promised her that he wouldn't make any advances. He said, don't worry, you're too fat for me. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. Thanks thanks for being brutally honest. (laughs) Yeah. So Jamie was definitely relieved that she didn't have to drive Cindy to school anymore. But the fact that her sister was sharing a house with David West was concerning. The problem was that Cindy was still on the same campus, and David would still stop to chat. So Jamie's wishing that Cindy had never decided to go to college. As a child, Cindy had to be dragged to school. She failed two grades, and she dropped out at 16. But she did go back and earn her GED. Yes, she did. That's the only way she could get into the college. Cindy had had two unhappy marriages, and she'd taken a commercial art course, and she got a job as a store artist. But on her second day there, she'd quit and announced that she was enrolling at Jamie's school to study acting. And her well-meaning but indulgent parents let her have her way, and that's how she ended up in school with her little sister Jamie. But Jamie was really annoyed that Cindy had brought David West back into her life. She'd met him two years earlier in a political science class, and he was a plain-looking guy with a thin, reddish-blonde beard that didn't hide his weak chin. An overbite gave him a rabbit-like appearance. Now he had a matching pair of cowlicks in his hair, and he had a bald eagle tattooed on his upper arm. So she'd been really surprised when she learned that he was an ex-Marine. He just didn't look like it. He didn't look muscular or tough or any of that. Now, then on Christmas Eve, 1978, he had called Jamie at home to say he was lonely, and she felt sorry for him. He didn't have friends, and he drove around with his pit bulls, offering rides to students in his van. So kind of creepy-ish. Yeah, very creepy. So Jamie agreed to see a movie with him. Now, he spent most of the evening complaining about his parents. He told her that he'd inherited $100,000 from an aunt in Tulsa, and his mother had invested most of it in a rotting old duplex. He said that his father paid more attention to his dog and his jazz records than to his wife and son. Well, back then, Jamie had thought, wow, he sounds a lot like my sister Cindy. Also, he had a habit of harassing women long after they rejected him. It seemed to Jamie that he didn't realize how his words could put off other people, especially women. He once told a group of students that he admired the Romans for perpetuating the health of their race. When they had a deformed baby, they just laid it on the hillside, he said. Then he would openly say that the mentally challenged should be sterilized. And he criticized the Nazis, but then in the next breath, he supported breeding a master race. So despite his non-threatening looks, he could also be pretty mean. A mutual friend had been with him when he knocked a gas station attendant with his car and then yelled at him to get out of his way. This resulted in a fight where David was slashed in his ear with an ice scraper. One day, Jamie asked Cindy, what do you see in that West guy anyway? And Cindy told her, I think he'll be good for beating people up for me. In October of 1980 is when Cindy moved into a spare bedroom at David's house and they shared a bathroom. The neighborhood had deteriorated while he was away with the Marines. So he apologized to Cindy, knowing that she came from a much better neighborhood. And when he realized that crime was rising in Houston, David bought a thirty-eight revolver 
which he kept under the front seat of his car. And sometimes he carried a military knife also. But Cindy didn't seem to mind his neighborhood or his house. The roof leaked. Some windows had been replaced with cardboard and aluminum foil. Mice and rats lived in the basement. David continually blamed his mother for his money being invested in such a dump. Yeah, and then he gradually realized that he and his new roommate had more in common than he thought. They were both sensitive, imaginative, and intelligent. And they both thought they'd been victimized as children and really enjoyed talking about that. Cindy was thankful for every compliment he gave her, too. So she made him feel needed and appreciated. No one except his mother had ever appreciated him, so this meant a lot to him. So Cindy was really David's project. He felt like he could help her transform into a real beauty. He taught her some basic exercises and put her on his Marine Corps diet. No starches, no grease, no sweets, no fat. And he reminded her to use proper posture and gave her lots of positive reinforcement. For the first few weeks, there was no noticeable progress, but then she did begin to drop the pounds. And she began holding her head a bit higher, applying her makeup more subtly, and dressing more neatly. It was time for David to show her off to his mother now. So Cecilia was glad her husband wasn't home when David visited with Cindy. He introduced her as my friend Cindy Ray, and added that she was Jamie Campbell's sister. Cecilia hadn't been impressed with Jamie either, and her feelings about Cindy were similar. But after a few visits, Cindy began to share her stories of an abusive childhood with Cecilia, and Cecilia felt some sympathy for her. She helped her tame her frizzy hair, and David began to feel more comfortable going out with Cindy in public. So in early 1981, Cindy was down to about 150 pounds, and other men stared at her. And in return, David glared at those men. His possessive nature was impossible for him to control. So Cindy needed him to protect her, and it certainly made him feel like somebody important to be her protector. Yeah, so they're kind of feeding off each other's mental illness. Seems like a bad combination of people. Yeah, I'm thinking that things aren't going to end up real well. (laughs) Well, as David and Cindy spent more time together, and she did grow more attractive to him, they finally started having sex. Cindy added to her stories of childhood abuse now, telling David that her father had sexually abused her for years and that her son Michael was her father's biological child. And she backed up these stories by yelling out daddy during sex and having some other strange behavior. So David decided that Cindy was just too talented and too attractive to fit in with the rest of the Campbell family. He'd seen pictures of her older sisters, Betty and Michelle, and thought they weren't in Cindy's league before or after her transformation. It was no wonder she thought she'd been conceived in Italy, he thought. She was everything that her mother and sisters could never be. Cindy told David that her family situation had not changed now that she was an adult, either. Her sisters got all of the money and attention, she said. Sometimes Virginia would give Cindy a dollar or two, but only after making her beg for it. In the spring of 1981, Cindy dropped out of school. She was now down to 130 pounds. David was no longer taking any classes either, so the couple was together pretty much all the time. His inheritance money was nearly gone, and although he was afraid of heights, he took a job as an iron worker's helper. Each morning, he rode the open elevator 70 stories up and walked out onto the four-inch beams. Oh my gosh, I could never do that. (laughs) I'd be clutching the beams. Yeah. He loved going home after a day of hard work. He looked at Cindy as his princess, and he took every opportunity to show her that he loved her. Yeah, but he still lost his temper a lot and started fights with his neighbors. Like just before summer, he was behind in his mortgage, and he went to his mother for money. And when she declined to help him, he grabbed her and started fighting with her. He actually grabbed her shoulders and slammed her down onto the floor. Then he left the house. An hour or so later, he felt bad for what he'd done, and he learned that Cecilia had cracked a rib and had a large bruise on the back of her head. So he rushed to his family house and begged her to forgive him, and while he was there, she went ahead and wrote him the check for the money he'd wanted. So kind of a similar thing there with Cindy and her parents, and him and his mother. Yeah. David was also becoming obsessed with Cindy being raped by her father. 
And as you said, that a lot of times when they were making love, Cindy would be yelling daddy throughout the, <laughs> the lovemaking. Oh, that's awful. So he asked her to stop talking about it. He said, look, the incest was over. Her versions of the abusive events were suspiciously changing. So he's wondering if it's all made up, but decided that the contradictions came from her trauma. Her original story was that her first husband, Michael Ray, had fathered her son, Matthew, but the older boy, Michael, was her father's. Then she said that James Campbell was the father of both boys. David's thinking, well, she's confused, and she's had enough mental problems already without being interrogated by him. So the next time she mentioned the incest to him, he said, Cindy, if somebody was doing all this shit to me, I'd fucking kill him. And Cindy didn't say anything, but she didn't seem shocked either. James and Virginia Campbell would always hurt Cindy, David believed. Her parents hated her, and it showed. He would feel better if they were gone. So she's getting him uh, coming around to her way of thinking. Well, she did say he'd be like a dog she could train. Don't forget that. That's true. Cindy had really tormented Jamie throughout their childhood, up until their time together at the university. So, Jamie was thrilled to move away from Houston and live in Knoxville, Tennessee, where some student friends she'd met on a trip to Switzerland were living. So she transferred to the University of Tennessee, and best of all, she would be a thousand miles away from Cindy. Back when Cindy was nine and Jamie was five, Cindy had tried to choke her in the upstairs bathroom. And when Jamie broke free, Cindy had warned her, If you tell, I'll say you tried to strangle me first. So Jamie had hid the bruises. Cindy insisted to Jamie that James Campbell disliked all of his daughters. Sometimes she said that he loved Cindy but hated the rest of them, and she would make Jamie cry. And Cindy had always received more attention than the other daughters, but she was never satisfied or happy. She made up some demon stories about their mother, referring to her as that selfish bitch. And once Cindy described being chained to a toilet fixture, and Jamie knew that she was making that up because they'd seen it in a movie a few days earlier. Jamie wondered why Cindy had to lie about her parents that were kind and loving, and that Campbell's life had always revolved around Cindy's needs. Yeah, she's like the squeaky wheel that's getting all the grease. And Jamie would also remember the upset in their family the first time Cindy had run away. Her father drove up and down the streets calling her name, as her mother despaired and waited for the phone to ring. Cindy had really put the family through this anguish over and over. She used the threat of leaving to get money, and she ran off with criminals and other lowlifes. She made calls for the return airfare from places she went to, like Chicago and Denver. Her parents would send her the money, then she'd spend that money and call them for more. In Jamie's way of thinking, her parents were very gullible, and the other sisters would wonder why their parents didn't just disown Cindy. But Virginia's answer was always the same. We love Cindy, and not just when she's good. But lately there had been signs that Virginia and James' patience was running out. Well-meaning friends had suggested that Cindy needed to stop getting handouts, and James agreed with this. When Cindy asked for money now, it was only from her mother, and she and her father were barely speaking. Jamie believed that Cindy wouldn't put up with this for very long. The situation was getting scarier every day, and Jamie knew she didn't want to be there when this all came to a head. So she had a lot of insight into what was going on with the family. Sounds like it, yes. Now, after her weight loss and a a nose job, Cindy got a burst of confidence. So she moved out of David's house and moved into an apartment owned by her parents. So she had a few boyfriends and some one-night stands. And occasionally she would call David, but it seemed to be only when she needed something, like a ride home from the bar. By the spring of 1982, Cindy hadn't spoken to David for at least a couple months. And then she called out of the blue to ask him for a favor. As an act of kindness, she said, she'd taken in two homeless men. Now this had worked out for a while but they'd been in her apartment for two months now, and they refused to leave. Oh, David, Cindy cried, I'm a prisoner in my own home. She said the men were armed also. Always happy to be the knight in shining armor, David began to plan their evictions. So he went downstairs and recruited his tenant, Jim Daggett, to help. Armed with a pistol and a shotgun, the two men drove to Cindy's apartment in David's car. So the unwanted roommates were out for the evening and David threw their things into the hallway. Then a short time later, a male voice yelled through the door. Cindy told them that they were out, 
and they didn't argue. And then two days after that, David came back to see if the men had returned. They hadn't, and Cindy gave David all of the credit for that. And she was friendly, but she wouldn't talk about the homeless men or any other men she was seeing. But David was always welcome to drop in, she told him. Yeah, as long as it's convenient for her. Well, yes. So Virginia and James Campbell had tolerated Cindy's difficult personality since she was a child. But James was finally putting his foot down. When Cindy's older sister Betty spoke with Virginia, she could sense that there was a lot of tension between them and Cindy. James still loved Cindy, he told Virginia, but he felt that she'd become a parasite, and it was partly their own fault for overindulging her. One night he lost his temper and he yelled, Cindy's driving me crazy, before he marched out the front door and didn't return for a few hours. When he returned, he decided that he would never speak to Cindy again. Virginia would still sneak some money to Cindy, Betty learned, but James was done with her. Betty and the other sisters talked this over and decided that Cindy had brought this on herself. So when Jamie came home from Knoxville for her spring break, she confided to Betty that their mother had told her, Jamie, stay away from Cindy and David West. Promise me. They want to ruin you. So it was worse than aggravating at this point. It was becoming frightening. Yeah, I think it would be. Look at this unpredictable behavior that those two have. I know. So, yeah, things sound like they're escalating a little. Oh, absolutely. Virginia admitted to Betty that she was afraid of her daughter, Cindy. I can't tell you the details. I won't tell one of my children how bad another one is. For a long time, I just thought she had problems, and it almost led to a divorce between your father and I. He saw what she was like long before I did. So Betty thought about this David West, worrying if he was a threat to her parents. Betty had concerns about Cindy's old boyfriend ever since she saw him in December. She'd been standing next to the family Christmas tree at her parents' house when a car pulled in. Cindy got out and walked up the driveway. The driver had his face turned toward the house. Betty knew there'd been trouble and David West wasn't allowed inside the house, but for several minutes he stared in her direction. And she thought to herself, that guy could really be dangerous. Now that holiday season had been different than any before it. And it started with the massive number of gifts her parents had bought for Cindy's two little boys. Her parents were raising them as their own, and the boys called them mother and daddy. Cindy didn't seem to mind at all, and she hardly saw them at all, really. But Betty was happy to see her mother was taking a more realistic approach with Cindy. She still provided small amounts of money to Cindy, but she turned down her demands for designer jeans and other unnecessary luxuries. Betty knew that Virginia had also warned Cindy that some tenants in the apartment building were complaining about the way she lived. Clean up, Virginia said, or there would be consequences. And she also insisted that Cindy look for a job. Yeah, but Cindy didn't find a job, and she didn't clean up the apartment either. Instead, she moved back in with David West, and they became lovers again. Soon, Cindy was complaining about her family again. She told David her father was still making sexual advances on her, then she reminded him of how he had once said he would kill someone who treated him like her father treated Cindy. Now she thought that this was a good idea, so she asked him outright if he would kill her father for her. So David had studied killing in military school and in the Marine Corps, he told her. All of his life he'd been trying to stand up for justice considering himself an expert on handling bad people. But he didn't want to be a cold-blooded killer. He told Cindy he would tell her how to do it, but he wouldn't do it himself. You get a gun that's not traceable, he told her. You pick a time and place where there's no witnesses. And you have to have an alibi. You make sure you don't leave any evidence. You wear gloves and a disguise. And Cindy asked follow-up questions. After a while, the tone of their conversation had moved from hypothetical to the real world. Her father deserved to be executed. David was sure of that now. But he didn't want to do it for Cindy. Now Cindy, ever resourceful, grabbed David by his arm and dug her nails into his skin. Think about it, she said. <laughs> she cried and went on about how her parents were hurting her. And David had decided by then that she was telling the truth about the abuse. His mother Cecilia had concluded that Cindy had been abused, and David believed that Virginia Campbell was a bitch, but couldn't see any justification for killing her. But Cindy told him more of the bad things her mother had supposedly done to her, 
and tried to convince David that both of her parents deserved to die. David said that he would think it over. So we're getting into really dangerous territory at this point. Yes, we are. Yes. And after several days of thinking it through, David still hadn't decided. And for him, the only obstacle was the mother. She was bad, he thought, but did she really deserve to die? But then Cindy told him that she would inherit some money, three or four million dollars, she said, if both of the parents died. And she promised to give David half of that. Listen, she said, I'm liable to inherit some money, and you can have half. They had to kill her mother to keep her from inheriting the entire estate. So David said, if I do it, it'll be for the principal, not for the money. (laughs) Good guy. Oh, God, yeah. He told himself, if we're committed to each other, then Cindy's pain and shame are mine too. He thought there was no excuse not to kill them at this point. And it was an okay thing to do since he wasn't doing it for the money. He thought, well, it's not Cindy's fault how she's turned out. She was dealing with this abuse the best way she knew how. And as her man, it was up to him to save her from them. So David told Cindy, yes, I'll kill your parents. He drove to their house with instructions to check the lights and unlock a first floor window. Cindy would sleep there and he would pick her up in the morning. At 6 p.m. on Tuesday, June 8th, he dropped her off at the end of Virginia and James' driveway. They were due back from a trip to Europe the next night. Hours later, Cindy called him from the house, and she mentioned that the maid had seen her messing around with one of the windows, but she told him not to worry. (laughs) So the maid was Maria. She was 58 years old, and she'd come to live with the Campbells back in 1977. She was a superstitious woman, and she was very devoted to the two little boys, Matthew and Michael. She did not approve of Cindy. Since she'd been living there, she'd watched quietly, disapproving of Cindy as she took cash, clothes, and food from her mother, and didn't take care of her sons at all. And lately, James had stopped talking to Cindy completely, and Maria thought that was a good decision. Months earlier, Virginia had told Maria that Cindy was returning home for good, and Maria had cried and explained that she would have to leave then. James said, if Cindy comes and lives here, I'm leaving too. So the next day, Virginia said, my husband and you mean more to me, Maria. Cindy's my daughter, but I know she's trouble. Now Maria had never heard her talk like that, and Cindy didn't move in. So Maria thought that was a step in the right direction. It seems to be. Cindy wasn't taking it well. Obviously. She's plotting revenge. Well, yeah. Now, her visit the day before her parents' return had been suspicious. Maria had seen her walking along the driveway with her shoes in her hand. Cindy stepped into a flower bed and began trying to open the first floor windows. Then she did open the window to the boys' room. But Maria ran outside and told Cindy not to do that. It's okay, Cindy said. And Maria then followed Cindy into the house. Cindy slept that night on the sofa in the den. She left the house on Wednesday with two bags of groceries and other things. So Maria checked and found the window of the boys' room unlocked, and she locked it and made a note to check the windows. Every day. She wondered if she should tell the Campbells about their daughter's odd behavior when they got home. But she didn't, because it wasn't that odd for Cindy. That's the kind of behavior she showed. Yeah, they were kind of used to it. So Maria almost totally forgot about the incident. Now, normally, whenever Jamie had a school break, her parents sent her a plane ticket to come for a visit. But that June 1982, they told her they wanted her to stay at school. To Jamie, Virginia hadn't seemed herself since before spring break that March. Jamie had gone home and found Virginia upset. And since then, Jamie had called home three or four times a week just to check on Virginia. On Thursday, June 17th, eight days after their return from Europe, Jamie spoke with her parents, and when she put down the phone, she knew that they didn't want her to be at home with them, and she wondered why. It made her nervous. Something was going on back home, and if you base it on history, it would be something to do with Cindy. Right. You would expect that. Yes. But at the same time, she didn't really have a clue what was going on. No, she just knew that their parents were trying to crack down, and Cindy was giving them a hard time, as she always did. But by then, Cindy and David were seriously planning out the murder of Cindy's parents. And David told Cindy that she had to go along with him. He needed someone to act as a lookout. He taught her some hand signals. He taught her how to breathe silently. And it was like being a Marine. 
They went over the house plans and she showed him where her parents slept in the front bedroom upstairs. They worked on alibis and how to act when questioned by police. And Cindy didn't seem at all worried or hesitant. She actually seemed excited. She never expressed any concern for her two little children who would be in the house when these murders took place. So she's just kind of a horrible person. Yeah, she's not real likable, is she? No, I understand that she may have been mentally ill. She might have had issues. But this goes beyond the pale. This is just an evil person. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And then Cindy came up with the idea of putting a few discrepancies in their stories so they wouldn't sound rehearsed. So she said, ah, we'll say we've gone to a bar. But she wasn't sure which one, only that it was a bar they didn't go to often. Then she'd get the name wrong, just a little. Like Pink Pussycat instead of Pink Poodle. Now David thought this was just brilliant stuff. <laughs> when David asked her what about the dog, Cindy said she had made him disappear. Yeah, she's evil. So David asked if losing a dog was upsetting for the boys. Cindy blew that off. She didn't care. She didn't care about the dog. She didn't care about her parents. She didn't care about her children. She didn't even really care about David. All she cared about was Cindy. So David bought a Colt 45 gun from an old Marine friend for $500. Then he went to a shooting range to test it. Once he was satisfied with that, he went to a shop where he bought a white hockey mask and spray-painted it black. In his closet, he found a dark ski mask for Cindy and two hooded jackets. He had two matching pairs of combat boots in his size, and Cindy wore multiple pairs of socks and boots, so it would look like there were two men. At a hardware store, he found thick rubber gloves which wouldn't show any fingerprints. Then on Thursday, June 17th, after one week of preparation, David told Cindy that they would go through with the killings the following night. He was ready. We're ready. Let's do it. Though in the days leading up to the murder, Virginia got a call each morning between 7 and 7.30. Maria felt like Virginia had been expecting each call. Conversations were short, but Maria was pretty certain that it was Cindy on the other end of the phone and that the topic was money. At 10 p.m. on Friday, June 18th, David drove Cindy to her parents' house to make a final check on the unlocked window. She went inside while he waited in the car, and Cindy returned a few minutes later and told him that her mother had come halfway down the stairs to hand her the $10 she'd asked for. She told him that the window had been locked again, but she unlocked it before leaving. At 11 p.m., Maria looked out of her upstairs window and saw James Campbell drive away in his Cadillac, and he returned about ten minutes later. Maria guessed he had run out for cigarettes. She turned out her light at 11.30, but couldn't sleep. Virginia just hadn't been herself for weeks, and Maria was very worried about her. Soon after midnight, Maria noticed that the light was on in the master bedroom. Somebody must have been reading, she thought, or maybe one of the boys had had a nightmare. She rolled over in her bed and told herself not to worry, but she was very bothered by dreams of someone being killed. So David and Cindy arrived at the Campbell house at 3.30 in the morning. After walking up to the house, David removed the screen from the unlocked window and jerked it open. Then he brushed off their boots to keep from tracking dirt prints inside. He stuck his head inside where there was a sofa. He shoved the sofa aside, then boosted up Cindy. They crouched side by side, adjusting to the darkness. Crossing the living room, he took out the forty-five and turned off the safety. He followed Cindy up the stairs. House was dead quiet. They climbed the last few steps to the upstairs hallway, and there was a nightlight lit up. Doors were shut on the left and the right. Cindy stopped at the first door on the right and opened it slowly. And David stepped in behind her. He saw a queen-size bed with a headboard to his right. The Campbells were lying on top of the covers. Virginia was on the near side. Cindy put her hand over the light switch, and David put both hands on the gun and whispered, Hit it, just like they planned. Cindy ran out the door as David took two steps to the foot of the bed. James Campbell rolled onto his right side. The first bullet hit him in his neck, and David aimed at Virginia's head. She moved as he fired. He thought he'd hit her in the upper arm. He fired a third round that pierced James's eye. A fourth round hit Virginia in the head. Pretty noisy. Very noisy and terrifying, because the little boys were sleeping down at the foot of the bed on the floor in their sleeping bags. But fortunately, I don't think David saw them. 
but he did step up to the bed and fire another round into each of their chests, and he ran down the stairs and out the front door to the lawn. He was twenty or thirty feet into the bushes when he stopped, and he found Cindy on her hands and knees inside of the living room door, combing through the rug with her fingers. She stood up and told him that she'd dropped one of her gloves. So he grabbed her by the arm. He said, fuck the glove. They were still in their masks, and they ran across the road when they saw a set of headlights. They hurried and crouched behind a bush as the car went by. Then they ran to the car. David drove to the first turn with the headlights off, and then he turned them on. As as he drove, Cindy kept repeating, the glove, the glove. David thought about how forensic technicians could turn gloves inside out and lift prints from them, so he was a bit worried about that glove she'd left. He turned off the headlights again as they went down a narrow dirt road toward the bayou. They parked among some trees, and he led Cindy to a narrow patch of land. He put the forty-five, the shoulder holster, and two extra magazines, Cindy's ski mask and three remaining gloves, into the pockets of their jackets. Then he rolled the two jackets together, tied them with the sleeves, and threw them into the water. He tossed both pairs of boots into the dark, murky water as well, but the hockey mask wouldn't sink. So they ran up the slope to the car, and he put the mask on the back seat next to a pair of skates. Then he drove to a dumpster behind an apartment complex, where he buried the mask beneath some trash. So Maria, the live-in maid, awoke to the sound of two small boys banging on her door frantically. They were screaming. Their parents were dead, and both boys had wet their pants. Maria thought initially that they must have had bad dreams, and she didn't want to call the police if nothing had really happened. So she had one of the boys call his uncle to come to the house, and while waiting for the uncle to show up, Maria crept down the staircase and called out to Virginia and James. There was no answer, and she called louder, and then she yelled out in Spanish, The children are in the apartment, but no one responded to her. When the uncle arrived with his wife, the gate and front door were open. He listened to the boy's story and called the police. Now this uncle had heart issues, so the two women tiptoed into the house to check on Virginia and James. They saw blood and ran back down the stairs. And on the way out, Maria noticed that the sofa in the den had been moved and the window behind it was open. She remembered that Cindy had tried to open that window just a few days earlier. That's right. Yeah. And remember Cindy had said to David that Maria saw her, but don't worry. Yep. Gotta worry. Well, of course. So the first responders to the scene found two dead bodies, but no shooter. The homicide detectives arrived soon after to assess the scene. The interior of the house was very ordinary and plain. There was very little decor, and an old television was sitting atop another one in the large, underfurnished living room. A paramedic pointed out a surgical glove on the rug near the open front door. An odd thing to leave behind because they don't normally just fall off, and right away this looked like an execution. The victims were just innocently sleeping in their bed when someone came in and killed them in cold blood. Virginia lay on her left side facing the bedroom door. Her arms were bare and her knees were curled up, but her nightgown was bunched up around her waist and she was naked from the waist down. So this seemed like an odd way for an older woman to dress with young children around. Blood had spattered on the headboard and made a fan-shaped pattern on the curtains, which were three or four feet away. There were flecks of blood on the ceiling. The woman's pillow was soaked with dark red blood. There appeared to be a graze wound on her shoulder, an entry wound on the right side of her face, and then another wound on the right side of her face and another near her right breast. This wasn't a robbery because she was still wearing a gold watch and her big diamond rings. Now James Campbell was a big guy. He was on his back in a t-shirt and boxer shorts. He wore an expensive watch too. His left arm was across his chest as though he was tensed or maybe trying to defend himself. His left eye was dark brown and opened wide and his right eye had been shot out. There were bullet holes at the base of his left jaw near his ear and in one cheek along the jawline. Frothy blood trailed from one corner of his mouth. There was a wound in his left side and a larger one on the right. A double-barreled shotgun was leaning up against a dresser, and that was something that James owned. So you have to wonder why that was there. Was he afraid? Did they feel threatened? But his wallet was also on the dresser untouched. 
so it didn't seem like a robbery at all. No, but if he's got the gun because he's worried that something might be uh, happening to them, yeah, you're not supposed to be sleeping through it. <laughs> well, no. I'm just wondering if maybe they were just on edge all the time. Yeah. And I... he decided to keep an, a gun in the bedroom, which is pretty dangerous with those little boys around. It is, but I think that's probably the correct idea. Yeah, that that's how they felt. Yeah. Yeah, just unfortunately, they never got a chance to use it or protect or defend themselves. Right. Four casings had collected between the bed and the wall, and another was found on one of the two sleeping bags on the floor at the foot of the bed. So that put the shooter at the foot of the bed, and they knew that because most automatic guns ejected to the right. A forty-five slug lay on the pillow next to James's head, and only professionals use this type of silver tip ammo. Detectives wondered why the intruder hadn't killed the boys and decided, well, I just didn't see them. But they they also figured the shooter had been a, a good marksman. So the den was just about as plain as the rest of the house. A side table held an empty beer bottle, a newspaper, and a pair of reading glasses. So it looked like someone had watched TV before going to bed. Behind the house, near the kitchen door, a window screen was propped against the side of the house. And the window had been opened from the bottom. So there was no sign of a break-in. The window had been unlocked. So police thought there was one possible suspect at the scene, and that was James's brother, J.W. Campbell, the uncle who had been called to the house. With greased back, thin graying hair, he looked a little shady to them like a professional gambler, but he actually wasn't. He was withdrawn and quiet, and detectives questioned why he had waited until he was at the house to call 911. Why hadn't he phoned right away from his own house? When he arrived, they wondered why he refused to go into the master bedroom and sent his wife and the maid instead. And then he had just stood out in the driveway until the ambulance showed up. Then he had showed them into the house and walked away. So they thought his behavior was a little weird. Yeah, just a bit. One of the uniformed officers said that J.W. had stepped on or near the surgical glove that was in the living room and then acted like it was an accident. So they did a short interview with him in the kitchen. He said he was the older brother, he was also a lawyer, and he often shared legal cases with James. He said he had no idea who might have committed the murders, unless maybe it was an angry client. The two boys had been in the room when the murders happened. Yeah. And they were found in their underwear in the maid's apartment above the garage. The older boy actually seemed more excited than sad, and the younger boy was in the corner crying. When approached, the older boy started to cry too, and he didn't want to talk to the police, and he said that he had the right to remain silent. Now, that's something J.W. had told him. The police were thinking maybe J.W.'s hiding something. But anyway, the boys weren't particularly helpful. The police did speak to Maria, but her English was spotty, and the detective's Spanish was worse. She did mention one name, though, Cindy. So David had pre-planned their alibi. They went to a party that was attended by 50 or 60 young people. Many of them knew David, and he knew them. They were punk rocker types, bikers, yuppies, and heavy drug users. (laughs) My kind of party. A good mix, yeah. By the time the party was breaking up, David and Cindy had talked to enough people to have witnesses to their alibi. No one would remember exactly when they arrived, or when they left, but they would say that they were there and they were acting normally. So they stayed for an hour or so until most people had left. On the way home, Cindy went back to freaking out about the glove she'd left behind. David decided the danger wasn't as bad as they had imagined. He thought that her sweaty hands would not have left any fingerprints inside the glove. Well, back at home, they discussed who they'd seen at the party, so those names would come to mind when they were questioned by the police. Then they took baths to wash away anything that might put them at the murder scene. Then they watched some TV for a while. By 6 a.m., Cindy was sound asleep. Not too upset about this, I guess. Police interviewed neighbors, passers-by, and the newspaper delivery boy. A Spanish-speaking detective interviewed the maid and heard more details about Cindy. There had been loud arguments lately with the mother, she told them. Cindy had a boyfriend named David, who was crazy, and who had slapped one of the boys before. The interviewer asked where Cindy lived and then went to her apartment. They knocked, and an old woman from the apartment across the hall came out of her door. They identified themselves, 
but the woman tried to stop them from entering Cindy's apartment. They went in anyway, and the stereo and the lights were on. It was a small one-bedroom apartment. There were open food cans covered in mold on the kitchen table and they found sketches of a young Asian woman. Two or three of the sketches were tastefully done nudes, and one had a vagina in the foreground of the drawing with breasts in the background. This was Cindy's work. The old woman from across the hall was Virginia's mother and Cindy's grandmother, Helen. She said she'd last seen Cindy at 8.30 the night before. She had left a phone number and said she would be reachable there in case of an emergency. So the detectives thanked Helen and left. But unfortunately, the phone number that Cindy had left Helen was a fake. The man who answered had never even heard of Cindy. So David and Cindy had a breakfast date with his mother, Cecilia, that Saturday morning for 9 o'clock. When they arrived at her home, Cecilia greeted them warmly. She wanted them to get married. She thought Cindy was such a sweet young woman. Now, David couldn't eat. He'd been listening to the radio and he hadn't heard anything yet about the Campbells, so his anxiety is jumping up. A lot more than Cindy's. Cindy's a pretty cool customer. Yeah, really cold-blooded. After breakfast, she insisted on stopping at her apartment. She never locked her door because she lost her keys so often, so she wanted to check that everything was okay there. Cecilia came along, and Cindy told her and David to wait in the car for her. A few minutes later, she ran out of the apartment building and said, Somebody's been here. So David went in to look with her. Garbage was thrown on the floor and some of the cabinet doors were wide open. It had to have been the police. And David wondered how they'd picked up the trail to Cindy so quickly. Was it the glove? Had they already identified a fingerprint on it? (laughs) All they'd have to do, which is what happened, is talk to people about who might have done this. Exactly. And... Cindy's name would be number one on everyone's list. You're right. And David. Yeah. So on the second floor landing, David recognized Cindy's grandmother. And she looked like she'd been crying. The police were here, she said, and I've got something to tell you, Cindy. Got bad news for you. Helen told Cindy that her mother and father had been killed by burglars. Now, Cindy's reaction, I guess you could say was over the top, but it certainly was unrestrained. Well, she had been taking acting classes when she showed up. Well, she threw up her arms, moaning and crying, No! (laughs) Tears fell from her eyes, and her shoulders heaved up and down. Oh, David, she said, it can't be not mother and daddy. Well, I just feel so bad for the grandmother, Helen. Cindy did hold her, and Helen patted Cindy and pulled away. Then she narrowed her eyes at her. Cindy slumped to the floor and covered her face. And David was really wondering what Helen was thinking. It seemed like maybe Helen had some idea here. He called the police emergency number and reported the break-in of Cindy's apartment just to get that on the record. Then he drove to his mother's home and took Cindy out to a burger joint. This time he could eat. Later, he drove Cindy to J.W. Campbell's house to be with the rest of her family. And Cindy told her sisters that she wanted to be with them in their time of sorrow. So the autopsies of Virginia and James Campbell were performed by Dr. E. Bellis, of the Harris County Medical Examiner's Office, and his assistant. Virginia was a well-nourished and well-developed white female, measuring 5 feet 4 and a half inches tall and weighing 131 pounds. There were 6 ounces of partially digested food in her stomach, including fragments of vegetables. She had died as a result of two gunshot wounds to the face and a gunshot wound to the chest. She also had a gunshot wound and a grazing wound on her right upper arm probably from one of the bullets that had killed her. James Campbell was also well-nourished and well-developed. He measured 6 feet 4 inches and weighed 201 pounds. He was dressed in blue shorts and a pink short-sleeved shirt and was wearing a white metal wristwatch. His right eye was brown. His left eye was collapsed with a gunshot wound in the internal angle of the eye. His nose was fractured. His stomach contained 3 ounces of a light brown fluid with nearly digested particles, some of which were identified as vegetables. James had died as a result of two gunshot wounds to the head and a gunshot wound to his abdomen and through his chest. Both victims had been normal and healthy at the time of their deaths. So although nothing appeared to be missing from the Campbell home, Maria found that there was a large amount of cash missing from Virginia's purse. She had seen the money when they'd gone to the mall together the day before the killings. 
Virginia's keys and James' briefcase were also missing. No one had seen Cindy since her appearance at her uncle's house, and her three sisters stayed up late talking, all of them sleeping in their childhood home that night. On Sunday morning, June 20th, detectives returned to the Campbell home. The rubber glove was on its way to the FBI lab for laser testing, but it was the type that rarely produced any prints. The night detectives had already looked at two suspects, Cindy Ray and her boyfriend, David West. They appeared to be college types, though, with good backgrounds. Cindy had no prior arrests, and David just had a misdemeanor for pot. He was an ex-Marine corporal, good conduct medal, marksmanship medals, and an honorable discharge. There was nothing to make him look like a killer. The homicide team met J.W. Campbell, and he seemed to be cooperating. They interviewed three of the sisters and learned that some of James Campbell's clients had paid him with TV sets and other merchandise. Maybe one of Campbell's clients had come back to settle a score. One of the sisters asked about the family dogs. Virginia and James had two dogs, Betty told them. She'd taken one to the Humane Society in May, but then where was the other one, Rufus? And Jamie said, well, I don't know. Cindy said he had wandered off. So we don't know what Cindy did to that poor dog, but she got rid of him. That's probably nothing good. No. So later in the day, Cindy and David showed up. Both of them looked pretty hungover. David shook hands and walked off into the den as though he were very familiar with the layout of the house. Cindy said she'd be glad to answer any questions, but first she needed some coffee. So they all gathered in the kitchen, and uh, Detective Schultz began questioning Cindy. She said that she'd lived at the Kingston apartment for a year, that she'd known David West for two years, and that she had stayed with him the previous night. She said she was unemployed. She had divorced Michael Ray six years ago, and the last she'd heard, he was living in Philadelphia. She didn't think her ex-husband would have any reason to kill her parents. Is it true your parents were trying to adopt your sons? Schultz asked. Cindy said no, that she hadn't heard anything about that. The last time she'd seen her parents was Friday night around 10, and she'd gotten $10 from her mother. So Cindy was just one suspect. David West was more of an unknown. He watched TV in the den, acting like he was bored. His girlfriend's mother and father were murdered in this house last night, but he seemed unfazed about it. Detectives didn't think Cindy was capable of such a professional double murder, because she seemed rather clumsy and incompetent. Well, at the medical examiner's office, detectives collected the evidence from Dr. Bella's autopsy. The killer had used silver tips so they'd self-destruct, but he used an automatic that left hulls with extractor and ejector markings, which would make it traceable. Most professional hitmen used revolvers because the hulls would stay in the weapon. They decided that the killer was less professional than they initially had believed. Detectives interviewed James's brother and decided that he was clean. J.W. said he would do anything to catch the killer. Some important papers were found to be missing, including insurance policies, deeds, contracts, stocks, and documents that were needed to assess the estate. The detectives visited James Campbell's old friend, J. Robert Harris, in the Houston Bar Center building, and Harris said he was probate attorney for the estate and estimated that it was worth over three hundred and ninety thousand dollars. So not, not not the three to four million right. that Cindy was crowing about. Exactly. And he didn't know anything about James and Virginia planning to adopt the grandsons either. Betty's husband, Richard, suspected that David West and Cindy were responsible. She'd always been a disruptive force in the family running away multiple times, getting married three or four times, dumping her babies on her parents, and constantly complaining that the family was against her. So Cindy was really the natural choice for the suspected killer. But was it reasonable to look at her as the prime suspect based on just her prior behavior? He wasn't sure, so he didn't tell Betty what he was thinking right away. Betty Hines sat next to Cindy at the funeral, And when Betty started crying, so did Cindy. But it was almost as though she'd been following her cue. Betty hoped that these tears were real. She really wanted her sister to be innocent, but she just couldn't help but have doubts. And Jamie watched Cindy and her boyfriend, and she just had the impression that they weren't upset at all. Cindy looked as though the funeral was just a minor ordeal. 
to be put behind her as quickly as possible. During the service, Maria stared at Cindy. It seemed to her that Cindy was enjoying it. She was laughing inside. Yeah, Maria seems like she was right on top of this. It's pretty perceptive. Well, she's a front row seat for all the arguments. Yeah, she's been there through it all. Yeah. Well, the detective interviewed the boys after the grandparents' funeral, and Michael said he'd been awakened by the light going on. I thought my father was going to read a book, he said, but then I heard four or five booms. I closed my eyes tight and covered my ears. He said he'd looked over the top of the bed when the boom stopped and that both of his parents' faces were red, so they ran to Maria's. When asked if they had seen the bad guys, both boys shook their heads no. So it was Wednesday, June 23rd, the day after the funeral, when the Campbell sisters gathered in the family dining room to discuss the parents' estate. Cindy showed up in a tight t-shirt with a logo across her breasts, Double Trouble, and the sisters were pretty upset by her tastelessness, but they really weren't surprised. And their uncle J.W. planned to put the furniture and other assets in storage while everything was worked out, but he suggested to the daughters that they might want to select a few things to remember their parents. Tearful Jamie said she didn't want anything. Betty asked for the piano and Michelle picked out a favorite oriental rug. Maria was there, too, and when Michelle asked her if she would like a memento, she declined. Betty turned to Cindy and asked, What would you like? Is there anything of sentimental value? Cindy looked over at David before answering. Well, I guess the VCR and the TV are the most saleable. (laughs) Wow, that's quite a statement. Maria J.W. and her sisters watched in distress as Cindy also picked out an exercise bike, the liquor cabinet. Full of liquor, right? Full of liquor. Yeah. And several other valuables. (sighs) David West carried each item out to his truck in the driveway. In the kitchen, he asked Betty, Can I have this French-English dictionary? I'd really love to go to Paris. (laughs) Betty glared at him and walked away. Wow, these poor people. I don't know how you can put up with that stuff. In the days that followed, Cindy did return more than once also to take things from the house. As her sisters were working to make arrangements for Virginia's mother and the two small boys, Cindy showed no concern for any of them. And these are her biological children. They certainly are. If you didn't know it, you would never have thought that Michael and Matthew were her sons. Cindy was much more interested in getting her money from the estate as soon as possible She had no concerns about who was going to raise her children. The other sisters felt it was wise to hold on to the house and sell it when they could get a better price for it because there was a grandmother and these two children that needed to be taken care of. But this sent Cindy into a rage and she started yelling that they will not tell her how to spend her money. So it's just a lot for those sisters. I don't know how they could deal with it. Uh, No kidding. Then a couple days after that meeting... Her oldest sister, Michelle, called homicide in a panic. Cindy and David had taken the boys. She said that Michael screamed and clawed at the walls, but Cindy and David grabbed him and took him, and Matthew just appeared to be in shock. Michelle worried that the boys had seen David kill Virginia and James, and that David was planning to do something to them. Oh, yeah, they were really worried. They were frantic. Cindy and David kept those boys for a few days. Once they felt confident that the boys had not seen them at the house doing the killings, they were done. They didn't want them anymore. So David decided they'd just drop them off at a a home, like an orphanage. (laughs) But when that home refused to take them, Cindy called big sister Michelle. The boys were screaming for Maria, who'd been raising them. But Cindy told the boys, you'll never see her again. So just cruel. Michelle told Cindy, take the boys to Uncle J.W.'s house and we'll take care of them. So Cindy just dropped them off there. Then she and David began to argue all of the time. She started gaining weight, she refused to get a job, and she wouldn't clean the apartment or even take a shower. She was quite a mess. Yeah. Yeah. So by this point, the, the three sisters were pretty certain that Cindy and David were the killers. David's friend, who had sold him the gun that was used in the murders, noticed that David had changed. He'd stopped working out. His home was a mess, and he was drinking and smoking pot. He'd also stopped taking his pit bulls out with him. Friend asked him what was going on, and David admitted to him that he had killed two people with the gun and then thrown it into the bayou. 
So the Campbell sisters had returned to their homes in Austin and Knoxville, but they called investigators daily with tips and ideas on the case. Jamie confirmed for the police what Michelle had already told them, that Cindy had once talked about killing their father. It was not the hard evidence they needed to bring an official charge, but it was interesting. Michelle called them when the maternal grandmother told her that she had seen Virginia's missing wallet and black coin purse inside of Cindy's apartment. Helen had also seen James Campbell's black briefcase in the trash outside of Cindy's door. Now Helen was in her 70s and she had been ill, and she was afraid of Cindy. When the police went back to Cindy's apartment, they found it to be a real mess, worse than before. Mold was growing out of the rug, and there were black patches of it growing on the bathroom walls. This was squalor. It sure sounds like. And Helen, who wasn't really capable of doing much on her own, her apartment was kind of going down the drain as well. So Helen came in with the police and opened her granddaughter's closet for them then reacted with surprise. Everything in the closet had been rearranged. The wallet and coin purse were gone. Cindy had been throwing out Virginia Campbell's gifts, including several expensive silk blouses. The outside trash had become quite popular with the homeless in the area. They'd wait to go through it before the garbage trucks came. Helen apologized for the things that had gone missing. Someone had picked up the black briefcase that morning from the trash barrel. The word dis- getting rid of evidence and stuff, right? Yeah, but just the fact that those things were in Cindy's apartment is pretty good evidence that she was involved. Certainly is. Then on Friday, October 15th, nearly four months after the murders, a detective on the Campbell case found a note in his office mailbox. This handwritten note said that J.W. Campbell had talked to a woman who told him that Cindy Ray had confessed to the murders. So the next morning, the homicide team sat across from an old acquaintance of Cindy, her name's Gwen Sampson, and she had warned them over the phone that she didn't want to talk to the police, but they were able to convince her that withholding evidence might get her arrested. Now, Gwen had known Cindy for quite a while, about five years, and she told the police her story about how she had taken Cindy in, but then had kicked her out about a week earlier. The homicide detectives perked up when she told them that Cindy had mentioned leaving a glove on the floor. And nothing about the glove had been mentioned in the press. So that was pretty good evidence, too. It certainly was. So on Monday morning, they played the tape of the interview for an assistant DA, and he advised them to have Gwen Sampson wear a wire, send her back to Cindy for more details. Gwen wasn't real excited by that idea, and they were trying to persuade her when the phone rang in her insurance office. She talked for a few minutes, then said, That was my husband. He had called her to tell her that he had just been laid off from his job, and Gwen told the detectives that she didn't want to talk just then. The next time they went to talk to Gwen, she wasn't liking the idea any more than before. She said her marriage was headed for divorce, her sons were upset, and her mother had just been diagnosed with cancer. So she was pretty overwhelmed and just was not willing to risk herself in order to get Cindy. So there's another dead end for the investigation. Yeah, but then Mrs. J.W. Campbell called to say that eight-year-old Michael Ray had new information about the night of the murder, which he had shared with an Austin psychiatrist. The detectives arranged to meet with him on a visit to Houston, and the boy seemed cooperative, but he wouldn't give them anything new. The next day, the homicide team received an unexpected call from Cindy. She said she'd just learned that her phone records had been subpoenaed. You can bug my damn toothbrush, she screamed. You'll never get anything on me. And she hung up the phone. So that didn't exactly make her look good. (laughs) No. No. But unfortunately, she seemed to be correct. Her sisters, especially Betty Hines, kept offering ideas, usually that Cindy must be guilty because she'd said or done these certain things. But there was no concrete evidence. The homicide team had used up resources and they'd worked overtime on the case for months but it seemed to be going nowhere, and eventually they kind of put it off to the side. Then three years passed with nothing new on the case. Cindy's siblings had no interactions with her during this time, and Michael and Matthew were being raised by their uncle. Cindy and David were on again, off again, and Cindy had a couple of boyfriends come and go. She'd regained much of her weight, she was unkept, and she was mean. 
She'd hired attorneys to try and force payouts from her parents' estate. And she'd ended up settling for $25,000 and the title to the four-apartment building where she and her grandmother Helen lived. But now her poor grandmother was living in a filthy, rundown apartment, no better than the one Cindy had lived in, and the sisters were trying to get her out of there. Betty and Richard had wanted to hire a private detective for months, but they'd put it off until the case was shelved by the homicide investigators. Richard and Betty called Clyde A. Wilson, a very successful private eye in that area, and Wilson's agency required a $1,000 retainer plus $50 an hour per agent, so that was pretty pricey. Richard and Betty actually used up their credit cards, cash advances, and quickly spent $12,000. Still, they hadn't found Cindy. Now, if Cindy wasn't going to talk to anyone, then the hope was that maybe David would. They knew he had a weakness for women, so the private investigator assigned a pretty female investigator to try to get information from David West. Kim Paris, using the name Teresa Neal, hung outside of David's house for a couple of days till he showed up there. And Kim knocked on his front door. When he answered, she said, is Charlie home? And he said, oh, you have the wrong place. But he let her in to use his phone. And they talked for a while. He was definitely attracted to her. He ended up inviting her to a get-together with some neighbors down the street. And within a couple weeks, David was madly in love with Teresa. And after two months, he proposed marriage to her. Yeah, early on, David hadn't spoken about Cindy or her parents' murder. He'd mentioned having an ex-girlfriend whose parents had both died in a tragic accident. But that was it. So Kim played it cool, but encouraged him to talk. She told him that she couldn't marry him until he opened up and was completely honest with her. So finally, David confessed to Teresa, Kim, that he had killed Virginia and James Campbell after she promised him that she would finance a new business for him. The confession was recorded by a recorder in the privatized purse, and he told how the children had been asleep at the foot of the bed. He told her how the children had been asleep at the foot of the bed and how Cindy had run out the door before the shots were fired. When he was finished giving her all the details, he said, There it is, blow by blow. Is that good enough for you? Do I trust you? You got my life in your hands now. Is that good enough? Is that what you want? And this was what the police needed. Yeah, but they wanted more. So they had Kim wear a wire again, and she told David that she'd investigated and found out that Cindy was lying to him. She had told him that her inheritance was still in probate, but she had actually collected her money and the deed to the apartment building. So when he heard about this, he got really angry. David did. He spoke more about the murder, and that was enough for the police to arrest him. Yeah, at first, I guess he couldn't figure out what happened. He knew that there was a connection between his arrest and his relationship with this Teresa. He thought she had likely been wired, and he realized that she'd been trying to get him drunk all that evening. He had finished off an entire bottle of wine, and he had talked way too much. So detectives wanted David to call Cindy and let them tape the conversation. They didn't promise that it would benefit him, but they said it would look better if he cooperated. So David said he wanted a lawyer. He called his mother, told her he needed a lawyer, pronto. The prosecutors insisted that they needed more evidence. Texas law ruled out a conviction based on the uncorroborated testimony of an accomplice. Right now, that was all they had. So they settled on a plan that took into consideration Cindy's reclusiveness and paranoia. They knew she wouldn't talk to just anyone. So they put out a press release saying that there's been an arrest in the Campbell case. And that put Cindy into a panic. Then private investigator Kim called Cindy on a wiretapped phone. Kim said, Cindy, this is David's girlfriend, Teresa. He's been arrested for killing your mother and father. He told me he did it for you, and you were supposed to give him some money. I understand you got your inheritance, and I need the money to get him out of jail. Well, a probable cause warrant was issued for the arrest of Cindy. And in January of 1985, Cindy had picked up her final settlement check from J.W. Campbell's office in Houston. Grandma Helen had been keeping watch on her troubled granddaughter, who was now living with a dog in the apartment directly below her. Cindy had gotten married to a man named Talal Mekloff, 
but she'd moved back into her apartment building alone after just a few months of being married. When the arresting officers arrived at the apartment building to arrest her, Cindy wasn't there. But when she did arrive home, she was all dressed up, and she was heavier than ever. She'd gained about 80 pounds since the murders. Cindy yelled and really carried on when she was arrested. She refused to talk and requested an attorney. A detective told her that David West had confessed and implicated her in the murders of her parents, but she refused to believe that they had West in custody. So they brought David in to prove it to her. After months of discussion, David's lawyers convinced him to plead guilty to first-degree murder and testify against Cindy Ray. David was sentenced to two life terms with the possibility of parole. He was denied parole in 2016 and again in 2019. Cindy's trial began in March of 1987. Her defense was that she was driven to kill her parents because her father had been sexually abusing her from a very young age. But there was absolutely no evidence or witnesses to support these abuse allegations. The prosecution argued that Cindy was angry with her parents because they were trying to push her to be more self-sufficient. And she used David West as her pawn to kill them so she could collect her inheritance. So the jury found Cindy guilty. She was convicted. She died at the Mountain View Women's Prison in Gatesville, Texas on May 18th of this year, 2021. The medical cause of death reported by the Department of Corrections was complications of encephalopathy, of unknown etiology, possibly nutritional, like you would see in alcoholics and that type of thing. Contributory causes included pulmonary hypertension with right heart failure, well, that's not good, and severe autoimmune thyroiditis. So not healthy. Not a healthy woman. No. She was admitted into the hospital in November of 2020, so she was actually pretty ill for several months before she succumbed. Yes, but you have to just admit that these were two very odd and very scary people who you wouldn't ever want to meet. Yeah, I would probably say that Cindy was scarier and odder. Yeah. But uh, I wouldn't want to meet any of them. No. I mean, I think she definitely did manipulate him, but he was more than willing, so I don't have any sympathy for him either. Yeah. Just a messed up story. Once he found out there might be some money in there for him, yeah. I'll help. Right. And then saying, but I'm not doing it for the money. I'm doing it for the yeah. ethical, an ethical reason to murder people. I don't know. Right. It's very messed up thinking. Right. Yes. So TCB's music is written and produced by Tristan Capel. Please send us your comments, case suggestions, and beer recommendations to True Crime Brewery at tigrabber.com. Or you can record a voicemail for us. We love to get voicemails. And if you send us one with some comments on a case or a case suggestion, we would love to play it on a future show. If you're interested in getting your future TCB episodes commercial free, getting access to an extra members only episode each month, and getting a gift, you might want to consider subscribing as a tie grabber at tiegrabber.com. Once you sign up, you can get the premium version of the show, which has no ads, plus the extra episode every month. And if you were to sign up now, you'd have access to all of those old monthly bonus episodes. So you'd have all kinds of stuff to binge on. Also, don't forget that we have merch you can buy on our website. If you go to tigrabber.com forward slash shop, you might be able to buy a Christmas gift or two. Or just buy yourself a nice beer glass. Something like that. That's a good suggestion. I think so. And if you like our show, please leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen. We really appreciate getting those. And now we have some feedback. Yes, we do. We have a voicemail and a couple emails. And I've got some voicemails on tap for succeeding episodes. So we're good with voicemails for a while. Oh, but keep sending them. Keep sending them, do. (laughs) Okay, so we have a voicemail from Jen that I'm going to play. Right. Hi, Jill. Hi, Dick. This is Jen. Maybe you can do the uh, case of Jane Hirschman. She's Canadian from Nova Scotia who murdered her husband in 1982. He was a total douchebag, (laughs) raped her, raped her children. She murdered him, but this is after years of physical abuse and he would do like really nasty things to her and have sex with the pet dog and put 
pipes up her bum to get her, you know, acclimated to anal sex. And this went on for years and years and years. And she was just like a shell of a woman. And he he was just a douchebag. He like he you know he had a criminal record and he would rob people and he was just a douchebag in Nova Scotia and. Anyway, she she killed him, and she got six months in jail because the court felt sorry for her and let her out, and she eventually committed suicide a year after. She shot herself in the head because she was so depressed and couldn't handle what had happened to her and her family, and so it was a huge case. And back in 1982, and I think the whole world knew about this case. It was just so horrendous and traumatic and like depressive and yeah that's it and so I like your podcast and I listen to you all the time and if you can do this case that would be great because you know you can shine some light on this case and if Americans don't know this case then you can say hey this is a Canadian case so I like what you do and Oh, well, she got cut off. Thanks a lot, yeah, Jen. She was running out of steam a little bit anyway. Yeah, I think she was ready to wrap it up. So, yeah, if we do this case, we have to call it a douchebag in Nova Scotia. That's my only requirement, Dickie. I think I was going to say the same thing. Probably. The other thing Jen suggested, she also sent an email. She would like us to answer more of the comments that are sent in on YouTube and so on. So... Uh, I will promise to try to answer more of them. Yeah, that's your job. You're in charge of that part. Right. And you say the same thing to me anyway, so. Well, yeah, because you are very short in your answers and your responses to things. So if you could be a little more chatty with people, that'd probably be nice. I see, and I will try. Okay. So we have an email from Kara with a case suggestion. You want yeah. me to read that one? I'll do this one. You do the next one. Okie dokie. So Kara says, this is my first time making contact, but I listen to you all the time, much to my husband's chagrin at bedtime. But who doesn't love a gruesome murder right before bed? I know, right? I know you guys like to space out the kid crimes for good reason, but I've got one that as a domestic violence survivor and social worker, I think is really important. John Battaglia was married twice. He abused both wives horribly in front of his kids, stalked and attacked them after they finally left. Judges and police didn't listen to their fears, and like so often happens, the fact that he was a danger to his wives did not make him a threat to his kids in the eyes of the law, and eventually to punish his second wife for leaving him and trying to press charges against him for his attacks, he called her while he had the kids for visitation, and she had to listen while he murdered them, the death of two young kids, just to torture his ex. It's such an important case because there were so many warning signs before the kids were hurt. Anyway, I love you guys. The authentic husband-wife banter and ribbing lightens all the heavy content and makes it all the more fun. Keep doing a great job. Well, thank you so much, Kara. I have heard of that case, and I think if we can get enough information on the history and what was done to try and protect these kids or what wasn't done, it would definitely be a worthwhile conversation. Yeah, so, well, yes. I forget the the specifics, but we did a case where the divorced father was having his two boys come over for visiting and accompanied by a social worker. And when they got there, they threw the boys in the house, slammed the door in the social worker's face. Oh, and, yeah, that's Josh Powell. That's right, a very famous case. Killed the boys and then set the house on fire. Yes, that's a so. horrible case. Yeah, these people are sick, and to let them still see the children... It's a problem. It can really be a problem. So I would definitely be interested in looking into that, and I will. All right. So our next email is a case suggestion from Patty. Actually, she has two. Okay. So Patty writes, I wanted to let you guys know about two interesting cases from my hometown area of Memphis, Tennessee. The first is the 1995 murder of socialite Emily Kleiss Fisher. Hers was a brutal death by stabbing more than 50 times, which took over 12 years to solve. In 2007, her killer was finally caught, and his DNA tied him directly to the crime scene. He was convicted and sentenced to 25 years in prison. That conviction was overturned on appeal in 2011. This case involved heavy drug use by Emily's son, Adrian. He was an addict since middle school and overdosed in 1999, 
four years after the murder of his mother by a local drug dealer. At the time of his death, Aiden was 25. The second case is in regards to Matthew David Pendergrass. He was 23 years old, attended Rhodes College in Memphis, and was two weeks shy from graduation. His family and friends report he was happy, focused, and intelligent when he went missing the morning of December 1st, 2000. His case is baffling and includes more than a few puzzling details. He's still missing to this day. Lots of information for both cases can easily be found. I hope you guys find these suggestions to be interesting. I love listening to True Crime Brewery. Well, thank you, Patty. That's awfully nice. Now, I do like the sounds of these cases. I have been trying to look at some more unsolved cases or cases of missing people because I think that would be interesting. We don't do a lot of that. Yeah, the the interesting thing about the Pendergrast case, left his apartment to go to class, has never been seen again. His truck was found that same day that he went missing in a swamp in Arkansas. And the fascinating or interesting part of this is the truck was locked. The keys are inside, outside the vehicle. His clothes, shoes, and wallet were found, but no David. So what kind of condition were his clothes and things in? Did it look like he'd been attacked or something? No. Because I would think alligators. Yeah, no. No, probably not. Well, that would be an interesting one to look into, so I definitely will. Yeah, we'll check both of those out. Okay. So we should have a lot of feedback for next week, right? We do. It's piling up. All right. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you for writing and leaving voicemails. We definitely do appreciate it. We certainly do. Okay. So we'll see you next time at the quiet end. We've got some seats down here. Come on over. Seats and beers. That's all you need. Yeah, got it. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.